Okay, we're in Revelation chapter 2 tonight. I need you to stand with me, please. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. That's strong, y'all. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Let's pray again. Uh, Father, thank you for the day and thank you, Lord, for the celebration time we had for Brother Gary this afternoon. And, and God, we have so many of our saints in our church that's gone on home and, and we're just standing in line waiting for you to call our name. And one day we'll be there also. And help us in the meantime, Lord, to do our part to be pure and to be holy. And let this church right here be a lighthouse, uh, not a place where we come just to be seen or uh, just to talk to our friends, but a place where we come and truly worship you. And help us tonight, Lord, and I pray you'll speak to each one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you. Tonight I have come to give a warning to Hickory with Baptist Church, and it's taken directly out of the Word of God. Last week we talked about the characteristics of a New Testament church, and the Bible lays that out very plainly to us, but we need to maybe have a warning tonight in this time in our life, in this time in our church life, to be very careful. Uh, Christians, we have got to put on the whole armor of God. And we have got to strive for holiness and purity in our lives, in our families, and also in our church families, because that is very, very important. So I pray tonight that God will speak to each and every one of us. And I want to say, first of all, there have been many churches down through the years, and you may know of some, that have gone by the wayside. Uh, They've been strong churches, but they've gone by the wayside for one reason or another. And whatever happened, the Spirit of God is not alive in there now right now. And God has put a little name over their door. Their front door is named Ichabod. The word Ichabod means the glory has departed. And that is very, very serious. And I want to tell you, it can happen. Recently, I was talking to a pastor And he said, he he was telling me a story about a church that had 2,500 members, 2,500 people actually that came uh, to the services on Sunday morning, and it is now dwindled down to 50 people who come on a regular basis, and to me that is very sad. What Satan does, he comes in and destroys what God began to build, and then the Lord will sweep down into judgment. You know, God loves us so very much, but my friend, God will not put up with sin. He will not put up with people who just come together and play games with him. So this is a warning to our church. I look at our church right now and I say, well, hallelujah, Lord. There's so many wonderful things going on. People are being saved. People are being baptized. We're trying to read through the Bible, the New Testament this year as a church body. And we could go on and on and on with all the good things that are happening in our fellowship. But we got to be very careful. The importance of reminding you that just such a thing could happen at our church right here. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we cannot be ignorant of Satan's devices, lest he should get an advantage on us. Now, whenever God begins to move in a church... And you know this is true in your own life. Whenever God begins to move in a church, Satan will counterattack what is going on. I have been in churches and I have preached revivals before where God the Holy Spirit has moved. And it's nothing that I did or anybody else did except get on our knees and pray to the Father that he might do something that we cannot explain. The sad thing is when you, when you talk to the pastor maybe three months, six months down the road after you leave from that revival, things have died back down and there's nothing exciting going on. 
when God the Father moves in a church body, listen, the wind will come and the wind will blow. Sometimes it's very soft and sometimes it's very strong. When the people of God get totally, and I mean totally right with him, and by that I mean, you know, Jesus has to be first, doesn't he? I'm not talking about putting Jesus on a list with everybody else, but he has to be first and foremost in our life. When we get up during the day and when we go to bed, what we teach our children and our grandchildren, where we work, where we go out and eat for lunch or whatever it might be, Jesus has to be first in our lives. And he wants everybody in Hickory with Church to be pure and holy. So tonight, uh, some churches that are a whole lot bigger than we are, that have a good staff, okay? They've gone down the drain and been destroyed by the power of the devil himself. And that, to me, it just breaks my heart. Now, what I'm going to say tonight to you is something very, very direct and very strong. And as uncompromising as I can say it, I love Jesus. I love you, but I love Jesus more than I love you. And Jesus wants the very best, friend, not second best, but the very best for your life and for your family. So we need to think tonight about the purity of the church. Now, in this, you know, there's seven churches. Two of the seven churches uh, need no warning. I want to just review that very quickly. Do you know what churches they are? One of those churches is Smyrna. It was a good church because it was under persecution and persecution always brings what? Purity. When a church is persecuted, if we're always going along and everything is always hip, hip, hooray, I can guarantee you by the word of God, my friend, that Satan is happy because we're just moving along down the stream with everybody else. But when a church begins to really seek God, and really want to know God's will for their life and their church body, and they believe these doors living like him and winning people to Christ, Satan is busy trying to tear it down all the time. So it's going to, I want to say some things that are very straight from my heart tonight. Now, the other church is Philadelphia. It was a pure church because they were out winning people to Jesus Christ. When we get to heaven... Okay, when we get to heaven, we're going to have to give an account of every time that passed by us, and we didn't use that situation to tell somebody about the Lord. You know, it's not very hard to tell somebody about Jesus. All you got to do is tell them what happened to you. You once were lost, and now you're found, and now you're saved, and now you want them also to experience the same thing that you have experienced. Well, the other five churches got some specific warnings from Christ. And I want to say the seven letters were to seven actual churches. They did exist in the time which Paul, not Paul, but John, had a vision and wrote the words of the Lord. But more than that, these are representatives of every church. So every church will fit into one of those categories, either five of them or one of those seven. So that's what we're going to be talking about this evening. All right, first of all, let's look at chapter 2 and verses 1 through 3. I'm not going to read those to you, but I'm going to mention to you they lost the first, their first love, and they needed to come back to their first love. And this is a very strong church. Uh, they worked hard. The Bible says they sweat and they labored and they endured hard, hardships among themselves. And they could not stand sin. When I see a church that can't stand sin, they deal with it when it comes up. That's pretty impressive to me. And they, they try the false teachers, and they deal with false doctrine. This is a doctrinally sound church. Now, do you know who founded the church right here we're talking about? None other than the Apostle Paul himself. They had a beginning like no beginning ever. Paul came into town, started preaching, and flipped Ephesus on its ear. Ephesus was a very pagan city. I was reading this over today. It says the temple of Diana was there. 
there were all kinds of prostitutes that dealt their trade under the guise of religion. So you can imagine what was going on in that city. I mean, you could probably go to many cities today, and it's the very same way. I mean, prostitution is, is rampant. You can go to downtown Memphis, or you can go to any big city across our nation, and a lot of that stuff is going on. But it was a very pagan city. And Paul came in, and you know what he did? He started preaching. And you can read about it in Acts chapter 19. And the sale of idols during that time fell off so much, the sale of them, that they wanted to take this man's life because of his preaching. But people were getting saved. Isn't that good? And miracles were happening. And this little church was pure and solid. And when Paul left, he got another pastor who was not half bad, and his name was Timothy. And if that wasn't enough, they got Aquila and Priscilla. And if that wasn't enough, they got the golden orator speaker, Apollos himself. He came in there and taught. I mean, you talk about a line up of good preachers and teachers. They had it. Now look at verse 4 with me. Nevertheless, what a word. I have this against you that you have left your first love. Again, I want to tell you that breaks my heart. I have something against you. The Bible says you have left your first love. Now, do you know what was happening in the church of Ephesus? They were falling more in love with their orthodoxy than they were with the Lord Jesus Christ. They were so happy with where they were. I mean, that they got their eyes off of him, and they put all their eyes on the church. Have you ever met anybody that's very churchy? I run into people like that a lot. They love their church, and we ought to love our church. But we should never put the building and the activities and the programs above the Lord Jesus Christ. You know why we come? We come here to worship Jesus and we depart to serve him because we love him inside and we love him on the outside. But Ephesus had everything, but they missed the one thing that was so important, their first love. The passion they had once for Christ. Do you remember that? Listen, the Bible says they had turned it into cold orthodoxy. They just went through the motions, and it cooled off in Ephesus. One thing I've never liked is a cold service. Down through my years, when I've got to visit other churches, I've gone in, and I have not been critical, but the Spirit of God just doesn't seem to be moving inside that congregation. You know when people sing, if they mean it or not. You know when the preacher gets up to preach or a teacher gets up to teach that they spent time in the Word of God and they want somebody to learn something that they might be more like Jesus. I've been in churches where they're very friendly. I've been in churches where when I go on vacation sometime, I mean, I've been to churches and they don't say a word. They don't say, how are you doing? What is your name or anything else? And you just have to Live like the Lord Jesus Christ. When the Southern Baptist Convention was in Las Vegas, a uh, long time, not Las Vegas, but uh, Salt Lake City. I'll never forget it. We went in there, Vellum and myself went into that church that day on Sunday, and, and right above the door to enter the congregation, the worship center, was enter to worship. I love that. That's what we're to do when we come into a church. And then when we left, there was a sign above the door that we left from. It said, depart to serve. We enter to worship, and we depart to serve. Now, it cooled down in Ephesus. There wasn't any great scandal in there. In other words, the preacher didn't run off with a woman. That does happen, by the way. There wasn't any organizational collapse you know what? They, the inner spring of love had dried up, and it became orthodoxy. The thrill is gone. Remember that fellow you've seen, the thrill is gone? But the thrill of Jesus was gone, and the enthusiasm of Jesus was gone. I love that word enthusiasm. It's two Greek words, in and theos, and it literally means that's God in you. Friend, when you realize who's inside of you, 
Uh, oh, hallelujah. Listen, when you realize who's inside of you, you want to get excited. And if we can get a lot of Baptists a whole lot excited, something might really happen for the kingdom of God. We yell like Comanche Indians at all these ball games, and we come into our churches, and it's just like a wooden Indian. I mean, we're just there. So they lost the thrill, and they lost the enthusiasm. Now, uh, we don't need to be losing our first love, do we? I want to ask you something. What we're talking about here, I'm almost going to be blunt. Is this a fair description of your life? It is a fair, is it a description of somebody else's life that you're a friend with and you might need to help them along and tell them what's going on? Can you honestly say this tonight? The more, more than anything else in this world, you love Jesus. And that's a big question. More than anything else in this world, right now on this Wednesday night, do you love Jesus? More than anything, do you long to spend time with him in prayer? Do you long to, do you long to read his word? We get so used to what we're doing, y'all, that it just falls off of us. And if we don't have time that day to do that, then we just don't do it. And that's what people do. Uh, if you don't want to please Jesus, then it could be that you've lost your first love and you need to come back tonight to it. You remember when you first got saved? I love to talk about that because I was excited. I didn't know all that was happening, but I knew something happened on the inside of me. I knew I was different because I didn't want to say those ugly words anymore. And I didn't want to go around with my fraternity brothers doing that alcohol anymore. I knew that God had changed my life. You remember when you first got saved? The excitement and the thrill should never leave us after about a week or two or a month or six months. Friend, it ought to get bigger and bigger just like a snowball. But so many times the devil will throw water on it, water on the fire, and we calm down and we come to church and we've been in church 10, 20, 30 years and all of a sudden it's just the same old thing and there's nothing going on in my life. But I love to come to church. I love to go to Sunday school. I love to sing in the choir. But friend, the thrill and excitement of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, look at verse 5 with me. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Listen to the Bible. Remember where you were and then repent. Remember where you were, church, and then repent. It is a sin when we do not love Jesus with all of our heart. Is that true or false? That's true, isn't it? Repent or do the first and do the first works. Go back to what you used to do. I mean, why does it take something spectacular to happen in our life before we get right with our heavenly Father? These are serious things. What happened to Ephesus? Jesus came and he wrote, the word Ichabod over the front door. The glory has departed. Okay, second church is verses 12 and 13. And we won't be long with all these. And to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, these things says he who has a sharp two-edged sword. And verse 13, I know your works, where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even in the days of which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Wow, what verses those are, friend. This little church was slapped in a city where it was a very strange place. Pergamos was the center of the worship of Caesar, emperor worship. Pergamos had the distinguishing mark of being the place where the altar of Zeus was placed. Also, there was in Pergamos, the Pergamese god, Esculapius, if I said that right. It won't matter in eternity if I did or not. This god was the god of healing. The people came from all over the world to come to this place right here so they could, they could touch Esculapius. Well, this is what one article said about that. They would come into the temple and they would lie on the floor. 
They would sleep there for days on the floor. There were snakes slithering and crawling all over everywhere. And when a person was touched by one of those snakes, that was the healing touch of Esculapius. Friend, I wouldn't want to be anywhere around any kind of snakes. I don't know about you. This comes from the old serpent himself, a demonic religion. And you know, they deal in kind of things like that today. There's a Bible of Satan. Uh, there's a church of Satan. And we don't have time to get into all of that stuff. But it's real, and they worship Satan. And it's all involved with the demonic. Look at verse 13 with me again. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was uh, my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. And then it, the doctrine of Balaam, down here in verse 14, it talks about the doctrine of Balaam. And you can find that in Numbers chapter 22 through 25. Jesus is saying the church at Pergamos, you have somebody in your church who is talking and teaching you that you ought to be infiltrated with the system that unbelievers ought to be mingled with unbelievers. Believers and unbelievers together. Now look at verse 16. Repent. Oh, I love that word. Or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Can you imagine Jesus fighting his own church? Uh, God hates compromise. Now, we're not saying that we shouldn't love unbelievers. We ought to love everybody, shouldn't we? And we ought to welcome unbelievers. You know, people who come into our church that are lost and they don't believe in Jesus, they need to see something different inside the church house. They need to see something with love flowing out of it. They need to see people who really care with them. That's why I encourage you, if you see somebody coming in by themselves, invite them to come and sit by you because many people are searching all the time, trying to find an answer to the empty void in their life. When the church starts doing what the world does, then we can just put a big question mark and put the word trouble right behind that because that's what's coming. I remember the story of a young person, this is very true, went into a church. Well, he didn't go into a church, but a, a big auditorium. There was a Christian concert going on, a Rick Rock concert. He sat down for about five minutes, and he got up to leave, and, and um, somebody said, where are you going? He said, well, I can get this anywhere. Now, I'm not talking about, listen, I'm not against Christian music. I love all kinds of Christian music. But there are some that sound just like rock music that you can't even understand the words that they're saying. And I got what that young man was saying when he went to that concert. James 4 tells us, friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. So to the church should be no compromise with Jesus. He says, I will come and fight against it myself. Now look at the third church very quickly in verse 18. Verse 18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things say the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. They had what Ephesus did not have. They had love. But they did not have what Ephesus had, did have, and that was sound doctrine. Two things make the church what God wants it to be. It is love and sound doctrine. You get too much love without sound doctrine, and you've got the Thyatira church. You get too much sound doctrine and no love, and you've got the Ephesus church. And both of those, my friend, were destroyed. Look at verse 20. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel. A lot of women have messed up a lot of things. Who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants. <coughs> excuse me. To commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, he's saying the problem with your church is sin. You allow that woman, you ought to kick her out. I mean, it's real simple. The church must deal with sin because, again, God wants his church very pure. 
uh, we are to discipline a sinning member. Have you ever been in a church where it does that? I mean, we talk about Matthew chapter 18 and, and disciplining somebody. I told you the story one time we were in the middle building and something came to my attention that we need to take care of a gentleman in our church. And I went and approached him about what might be going on in his life and I wouldn't dare tell you his name. And then I went back with somebody else and we tried to get this thing right with him that he might be getting back in fellowship with God. But you know when you fall into sin and you begin to play with sin, you don't want to be around people that might know about your sin. So he did not come back to the church. He and his family left the church. But he was the one dealing and living in this type of sin. Some of the people knew it, but we were doing what God wanted us to do. People are afraid they're going to be sued because you do something like that. Well, I say to Hickory with Baptist Church, we're going to stand on the Word of God. And, you know, we're not trying to be tough. We're not trying to be mean to anybody. We've got to stand on the Word of God that God might know that we're serious about, pure, about purity in our midst. Well, Ananias and Sapphira, they sinned and dropped dead right on the spot, didn't they? And the Word got out. What happened to them? You know what it did? It kept the tares out. It said nobody dare join that church. Word was out, don't join, because if you goof off one time, you're dead. Well, if we expose sin, that is, how do you do that? Do you get mean about it? No, you don't. You do that with more love than the most love you can give to somebody, because what are you after? Them to come back into fellowship with God and with the church. Well, fourthly, look at chapter 3, verse 1, about through here. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you're alive, but you are what? You are dead. What a statement. Sardis, the degenerate dead church. All the programs are going the machine is very well oiled. Uh, it's moving along, and God says, it's all dead. You're saved and secure, but you're sour. And that's how a lot of people might be. There's no life there. It's a big social activity. And friend, that's so very sad. In verse 2, he says, go back to the basics and get strong on those things. And verse 3 Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard, hold fast, and there's that word again, repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. When a church gets to the place when it's happy with its programs, when it's happy because all these people are coming, and all this money is coming in, and we're all excited about the denomination, that is a sad church because it's on the way to being a dead church. I love our programs. I love that people are coming, and, and we don't owe anything right now, and that's very exciting. But, friend, I want to tell you something. It must always be Jesus right here. Jesus. It's all about Jesus and what he wants to do in our life. Now, verse 4, it's a solid group of people. And then chapter 3 and verse 15, we got one more here. Verse 15 tells us this, if I can find it. Come on, boy. Okay, here it is. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. Now, do you know what cold means? It means totally uninterested in what's going on. In the gospel, I mean, you may just be turned off, no response at all. Hot means you're saved. But he's saying, what I cannot take is lukewarm. That is hypocrisy. That is a fake religion. And because you are lukewarm, the Bible says, I'll spew you. I'll spit you out of my mouth. And what did the Laodicean church say? Look at verse 17. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You know, that's pretty strong. 
That's strong words to a church. All they cared about was material wealth. Laodicea was an apostate church. Let me say this. All the things that I've said to us tonight, they have not come from the outside, but they have developed and come from the inside. You know what I found out a long time ago? If I take care of me, I don't have time to take care of somebody else. I've got enough store, stuff right at my doorstep that I need to take care of one day at a time. And if there's sin in my life, I need to get it out and get it right before God, before I can ever worship God. It's amazing to me. We try to come to our churches on Sunday and you know what happens? We've been sinning all week, and we can't worship God when we come into our churches unless we've been worshiping Him on a regular basis. Well, preacher, you're the preacher. You ought to be living right. Well, that's good, but I, you're going to have to give an account for you. Not your husband or wife, but you. Not your children, but for you. Every individual will stand before God one day. 1 Peter 4, 17 says, judgment must begin at the house of God. Judgment must begin where we gather together. Everybody's getting older. I see it. Don't you? Look at your picture when you were in high school and how much you've changed. You go to a class reunion and you don't recognize most of the people because some of them weigh 350 pounds. They don't have any hair. And I don't mean that to be funny, but I'm just saying, listen, we are getting so old and time, my friend, is running out. And we need to address these things right here and now. See, this is a warning from God's Word to our church and we have five examples of what they did. And every time God said, Jesus said, repent. But we don't want to hear that. Turn from that sin and come back to your first love. Do it right. So anybody need to come back to the first love tonight? You don't have to raise your hand. Is anybody in the church house a compromiser? Uh, do we look at sin lightly in our church? Are we program-oriented instead of spirit-oriented? And are you hot or cold or lukewarm? I love some people because they're the same all the time. Some people, you don't know if they're going to bite your head off tomorrow, but they're in a good mood today. <laughs> I have tasted hot water, and I have tasted cold water, and I've tasted lukewarm water, and the lukewarm water you want to spit out of your mouth. So there's a warning, a big warning coming out. You know, I still believe with my heart that we are at the crossroads definitely in the United States of America, and we better, we better learn what we need to be doing as a Christian citizen, okay? And we need to be the, the lighthouse. That's just the word that that we use all the time, but we need to be a light for a dark society. Now, I don't know what you do when you go away from this church. Nobody knows but you and God. All we got to do is ask you married folks, what your children, what y'all do, and they're going to open up and tell us because they talk and they see the true mama and the true daddy, the, the true grandfather and the true grandmother. So what a message to the churches right here. And I believe that's relevant for today in the year 2023. So I really am glad you came tonight. And I'm glad that you're going to be like Jesus. And if there's anything, y'all, hey, please, you may not be here next week. Where are you going? Well, you may be gone, gone. That means bye. You're gone. See, we're not promised another day, and, and we know that. We know the evil in this society. We know the evil from the newspaper and the, on the computers, the, the newspapers and all that stuff like that, and the television. We know all that. So why not live the rest of your life in the center of God's will? In a few years, you'll be glad that you did. Let's stand.
Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for the example here in the book of Revelation. Oh, God, there's so much in these verses. So much, Lord, you've got to say. But I do thank you, Lord, for the example that you brought out in each one of them. And we know it's true. And Father, I know that my prayer and all of our prayer is that this church will be a pure and holy church. And God, I'm going to ask you for something. I'm going to ask you to clean it out and clean it up. It's in your name we pray. Amen.